Our speaker, David Hart, is the online library director at the Liberty Fund and academic editor of the collected works of Frederick Bastia. Dr. Hart is a historian and a libertarian with interests in the history of classical liberal tradition, especially the French, war and culture, libertarian class theory, and film. He has a PhD from King's College in Cambridge, a master's from Stanford University, and a BA honors degree from Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. He taught in the Department of History at the University of Adelaide in South Australia for 15 years before moving to the U U.S., where he now works for a nonprofit foundation. Dr. Hart is the director of the Online Library of Liberty Project and the academic editor of the collected works of Bastia in six volumes. And volume three, I'm happy to say, has just been published uh, last week. Uh, in addition to his many academic writings, in, in 2016, Dr. Hart completed a screenplay about the life and work of Frederick Bastia entitled Broken Windows, which is available online and I recommend it. I've known David for several dec decades now and consider him to be the foremost living authority on the classical liberal tradition, including Bastia. The topic of Dr. Hart's lecture is Frederick Bastia, the Unseen Radical. Thank you, Joe. Thank you to the Mises Institute um, for inviting me to give this lecture. And I also want to thank you for uh, arranging uh, Bastiat's name so usefully above my head. <clears throat> and I, the other person I've written on uh, extensively, his name is just over there, Gustave de Molinari. So I've been, there's a pincer movement going on here to uh, restrain me on the stage, I think. Um, Henry Hazlitt and Bastiat both were very important in my own intellectual development. Um, I was a high school student in Sydney, Australia, when I discovered the works of uh, Ayn Rand and Ludwig von Mises, and I subscribed, sent away to a Foundation for Economic Education and to Laissez-Faire Books, which was based in San Francisco, and I would order boxes of books, which the postman would laboriously walk up the driveway of my parents' home in Sydney, saying, um, why are you buying all these books from America? Don't we produce books in Australia? Um, some of those books that came from the Foundation for Economic Education included their editions of Bastia that were done in the 1960s, as well as Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. And uh, that was really my introduction um, to free market economics, which was then closely followed by reading of Rothbard and Mises and other people. So I have a profound intellectual debt to both um, Bastia and, and Henry Hazlitt. What I want to do today is to talk to you about some aspects of Bastiat's life and thought that may not be well known to you. And I've called it the unseen radical. And this is obviously a play on words on Bastiat's last and perhaps best known work, The Seen and the Unseen. Um, and if you remember, Bastiat defines a, um, a bad economist as someone who just looks for the immediately obvious effects of a government policy. The good economist, however, knows that there's something deeper going on, that some of the consequences will be hidden, or they will be delayed, or they will be difficult to immediately identify. And so um, he described um, the things that were immediately seen um, as the obvious, the unseen as the more complicated. But I think there's, that can also be applied to Bastiat. He went through several periods where he was virtually unseen for his contributions both in his own day and in today, uh, today. And I want to try and unpack some of those for you. The word radical I use in a number of different ways. Um, first of all, there is the radicalism of his personal style and behavior. And this doesn't come out in the biographies that I've looked at him, uh, about him, uh, but it did come out in the correspondence, which was in our volume one. He was a really radical, unique individual. And I want to give you a flavor of that, both in his dress, his language, and his attitudes to other people and society in general. Another type of, another usage of the word radical is his innovative ideas and his um, theories. And um, one of the things that made him unseen to his own colleagues, they did not appreciate the originality and the um, complexity and the great worth of his theoretical work. They dismissed him as many people um, have done since, as just a good um, economic journalist. 
So he, frustratingly for him, he wasn't fully appreciated and seen in his own day. And then today we have people um, who do see different sides of it, of, of Bastia. We have, in free market circles, he's widely regarded as, for his writings of, of the economic sophisms, which are some of the most brilliant economic journalism ever written. Conservatives today see him as the author of The State and the Law, two important essays about limited government and the nature and origin of, of law. And the Austrians also appreciate and see him because of his um, quite precocious insights into subjective value theory, well ahead of his time. But my argument is that there is much, much more to Bastia. And um, what I've been uncovering in my um, editing of the collected works, this is um, volume three, about 700 pages has just come out. This is of a projected six volume series, so about 3,000 uh, words in, in total. One of the problems was with, with seeing the true Bastiat is that when Fee did their translations in the mid-1960s, they translated less than half of his work. And so there's a lot, um, if that's all you know about Bastiat, you're in for a surprise, and a pleasant surprise, because there is so much more to, uh, to the man. Let me just give you a brief list of some of the things that I think make him a radical and very interesting libertarian theorist and activist and personality. One of the first things that happened, uh, that came to my um, attention was when I was doing, reading through the, his letters, was he had an initial radicalization as a young man at a private college which had a very innovative curriculum, which shows the importance of not having a state education if you want to think in, critically and um, as a real individual. He, was, he became, in his 20s, somewhat of a social radical and bon vivant and a non-conformist outsider, and he took that with him uh, from his um, provincial origins to Paris when he went there in the, in the mid-1840s, much to the consternation of his more conservative, conservative, shall I say, socially conservative colleagues amongst the economic circle in Paris. Then when he was a, a, an economic journalist writing some wonderful uh, essays attacking subsidies and, and economic protection and tariffs, he developed a whole new rhetoric of liberty it's my expression to describe his style, his rhetoric of liberty, and his, uh, his willingness to use harsh language to describe the bad consequences of government actions. Um, so he would call a spade a spade, or as the French say, appelé un chat chat, to call a cat a cat. And I think there's a considerable simil similarity between Bastia and Rothbard, because Rothbard also used harsh language to talk about how the state plundered and murdered um, and so on. Another factor in his radicalism is uh, it's not well appreciated how much he was opposed to things like military expenditure and war and colonialism. And conservatives who appreciate his writings on free trade often don't want to know that this was intimately connected to his opposition to war. Another factor that made him a radical is he had utopian dreams. I call, I call him these utopian dreams utopian because he himself described in one of his great economic sophisms called the utopian. He had utopian dreams about what he would do if he were made dictator for a day, which was to drastically slash government, both its expenditure and its size and scope. Um, and that wasn't the only time he did this. There are other writings where he expresses his utopian dreams to dismantle the state. Another aspect of his radicalism is his active support for the revolution of, that broke out in February of 1848 and the inauguration of the Second Republic. And he was very active in the Second Republic as a member of the Chamber of Deputies. But he was also willing to go out onto the streets of Paris with uh, a little magazine that he and friends like uh, Gustave de Molinari produced and handed out on the streets to the workers, trying to persuade them not to take the socialist ideas seriously, to um, think more about free markets and about uh, private property rights. And he was on the streets of Paris twice, once in February, March, and then again in June, when the troops were called out to uh, put down the rioters and hundreds, if not thousands of people were, just, were killed when the French uh, military were firing artillery down the streets of Paris to destroy the barricades. And Bastiat in some of his correspondence talks about how he was caught on the streets while he was handing out these pamphlets and what he did um, to try and help some of the injured um, uh, people. He's also played a very important role in the Chamber of Deputies 
uh, as the vice president of the, of the finance committee. Um, they recognized his, when he was elected um, to the chamber in April of 1848, he was immediately appointed to um, this important position in the finance committee and he would make regular reports to the chamber about the state of French finances and he was constantly telling them, we are in a crisis, we have to cut government expenditure, we have to balance the budget and if, in order to do this, we have to slash military expenditure because that was the single biggest item in, in the budget. On top of all this, uh, while he's you know, agitating for free trade, while he's in the, uh, in the Chamber of Deputies um, lobbying to balance the budget, he's also realized that he had some important and original economic ideas which he was trying to put together to write his um, important theoretical treatise, Economic Harmonies. And the tragedy of, of that, of course, is he kept getting distracted by um, the political events around him. Um, I guess you'd call a revolution a kind of distraction. Um, and he um, never was able to finish writing this book. Uh, he, he, he knew that he was dying. Um, I think he was dying of um, throat cancer, which was extraordinarily painful. And he was probably on laudanum uh, to try and keep the pain under control. And to the very end, he kept um, writing and, and working on his project but he only was able to finish the first volume, which was published in um, January of 1850. And after his death um, on Christmas Eve in 1850, his friends and colleagues put together the remnants of his papers in, a, in an expanded volume, which was about twice the size, uh, which came out in mid-1851. But when you read through not just um, the sketches and chapters of, of the um, economic harmonies scattered throughout his other writings, I've um, found about a dozen or so key innovative economic ideas, many of them Austrian, some of them public choice, other just, others just good economic analysis. Um, and I thought, well, when did he get some of these ideas? When did he um, start thinking in this original way? And my original hunch was that when he went to um, <coughs> Paris, it was to, to work as a journalist and a free, free trade activist and that he learnt economics when he was in Paris mixing with these other economists. But just in the last couple of weeks, as I was working through volume four for, the, for our collected works, I was trying to track when he first used some of these key economic concepts. And I kept coming back to uh, one essay that he wrote um, to criticize Lamartine, the famous um, French poet. Um, and in an article that he wrote in January 1845, so before he moved to, to Paris, he already had in his mind eight or ten of these key economic ideas already in his head. So he went to Paris, I think, with his mind full of innovative and original ideas, and it wasn't the influence of the other Paris economists around him that led him to write Economic Harmonies. And I'll say a little bit more about that more in a moment. Um, so he's an innovative theoretical economist, I think, ahead of his time by many years, if not decades. And it, it took someone like Rothbard back in the 1950s and 60s to see, to recognize Bastiat's originality and to actually use him as a, as a stimulus to, in, in the first three or four chapters of, of Man, Economy and State. If you read the footnotes carefully, and I love footnotes because I write too many of them in, in the <laughs> Bastiat translation. Um, you'll see Rothbard's debt to Bastiat's methodological individualism. And I'll say a bit more about that if you want. In addition to being a theoretical or a budding theoretical econo economist who had his career cut short by his premature death, he was a theorist of classical liberal class analysis. And his theory of plunder is, of course, one of the key terms in that uh, theory. Um, it was, he was going to write a, a history of plunder after he had finished, <clears throat> he had a plan to write three volumes. Um, the first volume, he planned to write um, a volume <laughs> called Social Harmonies. And this was to be about how um, voluntary action creates um, cooperation and harmony um, in the social realm, which is you know, the family, um, the church, um, society at large. And then he found out he was running out of time um, and he really had to concentrate on one particular type of harmony and he decided to focus on economic harmony. So that was meant to be volume two. And then the history of plunder was meant to be volume three, which was not just a history of plunder, but a history of disharmony. The first two volumes were to be about harmony and how harmonies played out 
when free, people were left free to, co to cooperate amongst themselves. And then, of course, he realized that history was full of disharmony, full of statist activity, which created uh, disharmonies and um, plunder and uh, class uh, rule and so on. And that was to be the volume, the, the third volume in his series. Um, so that's just to give you a, an overview of some of the radical aspects of um, Bastiat's thinking. Um, and I, wanted, I won't have time to talk about all of those, unfortunately, because um, there is a book here, I think, and the book is slowly emerging, and I'll get around to finishing it one day. The, other, the sad thing is that um, most of the people who have worked on this project have died, and I think I'm the last surviving uh, member of the original team. So this is like the curse of um, Bastia on whoever works on this project. <laughs> Uh, we've lost um, two translators and the original general editor, Jacques de Ganem. So, um, wish me luck, you know. In the <laughs> <laughs> so, that's just the, the overview. Let me just um, show you some of the... On seeing uh, or not seeing Bastiard depends on where you're standing. And when I was standing in Sydney in Australia reading Henry Hazlitt and Bastiard for the first time, my initial reaction um, to Bastiard was... He is a very clever and smart and witty journalist and left him at that and moved on to more serious economists, serious economists like Mises and Rothbard. It was only when I um, was um, asked by Liberty Fund to work on this project about 12 years ago that I went back and read for the first time in French everything that Bastiat had, had written. And I was ashamed, to, I had completely misunder, underestimated and misunderstood the significance of Bastiat as a serious social thinker. And um, I'm trying to make a, 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 some atonement for those, uh, those, that original sin of, of not paying full attention to Bastiat. And part of the problem is that he's such a good writer that you're just swept up by his writings and you don't look deeper. It's only when you start looking at it more closely and you realize how is this constructed? What are the underlying ideas? Who is he referring to? Um, he's constantly quoting French literature, which showed a deep um, uh, reading of, of Moliere and La Fontaine and some of the other French classics. Um, and so it, it really, hit the, the perspective um, understanding of, of who and what Bastiat is depends on time and place. And, and he's had a terrible um, track record of, of, first of all, He's not understood by his colleagues. He, he's forgotten in the late 19th century, practically. Um, people like Schumpeter say that he's, um, uh, his famous quote, you know, what kind of a theorist was Bastiat? He says, I don't think he was a theorist of any kind. Um, um, and then even Hayek uh, grudgingly sort of condemns him with faint praise by saying, yes, he was a great um, uh, economic journalist. It's best not to ask too much about him as a theorist, you know. Um, so... This is um, Henry Hazlitt, Economics in One Lesson. And we can, if you've read anything, if you read the introduction to this book, you'll know that Hazlitt was deeply indebted to um, Bastiat. Um, and he plagiarized um, Bastiat's subtitle in the title of his book. Um, this is the um, edition that um, Arcee Hoyles, um, he, Arcee Hoyles, it was a, um, uh, journal, uh, publisher of, of newspapers in America. He st started the Freedom uh, newspapers um, chain and he moved to Santa Ana, Southern California and uh, came across, um, and, uh, he met Leonard Reed who was then the head of the Chamber of Commerce of Los Angeles and uh, somehow they discovered the, write the writings of Bastiat and some 19th century translations. Um, I think the, the story I've read is that um, Leonard Reed was giving a, a talk for the Chamber of Commerce in Los Angeles and someone came up to him and said, you sound just like Frederick Bastiat. And he said, who the hell is Frederick Bastiat? I've never heard of him. And um, so he went back and found these 19th century translations of, of Bastiat and talked to Hoyles and Hoyles was on this anti-New Deal, anti-FDR campaign and saw immediately that um, Bastiat's writings was perfectly relevant to... 1940s America. And so he used the printing presses of the Santa Ana Register to print these wonderful red um, covered editions of Bastiat, which I'm interested to, to see. Rothbard has these exact editions in the library outside, as does the founder of Liberty Fund, Pierre Goodrich. He has copies of this. And um, when I was here last year, I took a photograph of 
Rothbard's copies, and he, he mutilated these books. Uh, and here is a, a page from the economic sophisms um, where he's underlined so much stuff, and then he has written magnificent at the bottom. It's a pure Rothbard. So, you know, if you want to have a, a chuckle, go out and read some of um, Rothbard's comments on, uh, on Bastia. But, you know, he, so he was discovered by Hoyles and Leonard Reed in the 40s, and then Rothbard, through them, I think, discovered Bastia, and Bastia uh, has been in, known by libertarians and conservatives ever since. But it wasn't always that way. And um, this, I want to briefly talk about his background, um, where he came from. Um, <clears throat> and you'll have to pardon some of the puns and alliterations I'm going to use, like a guy in Gascony, because that's how Bastia wrote. His writings are full of plays on words. And one of the most laborious things I had to do in editing um, the series was to explain his jokes in English, right? There's nothing funnier than a footnote that explains a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a horrible faux pas, if you'll pardon the French. Um, <laughs> so where did Bastiat come from? Well, as we know, Paris is the centre of the universe. And this is, you know, he, he came from... A place that he was born in Bayonne, which is in Basque country, um, close to the Spanish border, and so he grew up. His his, his grandfather was a business man, an importer and exporter, and the business suffered terribly under the Napoleonic um, restrictions uh, of the of during the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, the the other thing that's of, of note is that um, Bayonne is is Basque, and and the Basque people. Um, so stupid they don't understand the benefits of nation states and borders. <laughs> and so they have no respect whatsoever for this artificial line drawn between Spain and France because there are Basque people who live on the northern side and there are Basque people who live on the southern side and they're just trading with their kinfolk. And so Bastia grows up in a place where there is constant smuggling which drives the French um, government crazy. Um, when he... Um, his grandfather died. His parents died when he was very young. When his grandfather dies, um, when he's when Bastia is 25, he inherits the um, his grandfather's estate in Mugron, uh, which is a very small place, and he lives there for the next 20 years. Um, he's a, a local magistrate. Um, his, he was his reputation was a, was that he was a very good magistrate, very efficient. Um, he was in, intellectually curious, um, and he read for 20 years, everything he could lay his hands on in economics in four different languages. Um, French, Italian, um, English, and Spanish. Um, and I'll, how he got to this interest and this gift with language, I'll, I'll explain in a moment. When he was a young, when he was about 14, his uh, grandfather sent him to a college in Sorez. There was a, a Benedictine abbey in Sorez which had um, a college, and it was a private college. And what had happened was that um, it was run by the Benedictines. It was um, turned into a military college in the late um, 18th century to train young aristocrats, the sons of aristocrats who wanted to be, go into the army. And then during the, French, the first French Revolution in the 1790s, um, much church property was uh, confiscated and then sold off, and some entrepreneurial um, educator bought um, the land and turned it into a private college. And Bastiat went to this private college. Um, and this had a transformative experience on him. Um, this is the postcard from the 19th century showing the, the college. And what happened was that this college was, had a reputation when Bastiat went there in about 1814, um, 1815. Um, the college had 400 students and they came from all over the world, mostly from Europe, but there was a sizable contingent from England and America, which is how Bastia learned English. Um, they had a radical uh, curriculum and they didn't teach um, Latin or Greek. Um, they taught modern languages, they taught modern literature, they taught music, um, they taught um, mathematics. And that's where Bastia got this love of reading. He, he, he was a, won, the, won the school prize for poetry. Um, he also, I think, had a photographic memory in that he learnt all this stuff, uh, this, these passages from La Moliere and La Fontaine and others, and he could recite them, uh, and did, repeatedly. 
both in his, his writings and also in his social uh, networks. Uh, he was involved in various uh, liberal salons in Paris when he was living there, 1846 to 50. And he used to regale people at these liberal salons with um, recitations of um, classic works of um, French literature, but he would also do parodies, um, impromptu parodies, where he would um, change the names of some of the characters to uh, the names of current politicians and make fun of them. Um, he also learnt the cello um, at, at Sorez, and uh, he loved the cello and took it with him and played music all the time, which he'd also do at these salons in Paris, much to, the again, the consternation of, of some of the more conservative members. Um, he also loved singing. And this is where <clears throat> I've called this in vino libertas, in wine there is liberty, Bastia, Béranger, and Bayonne. Um, Béranger was a, a very important um, political songwriter of the period. Um, and so when Bastia leaves the College of Sorez and goes back to work in his grandfather's um, uh, business, um, he begins to mix with uh, liberal groups in Bayonne. Um, at that period, though, this is in the early 1820s, political meetings and parties were, were strictly banned. Um, so the only way that you could talk, this was during the uh, uh, restoration of the Bourbon monarchy and there was, uh, they were trying to restore as much of the old regime as possible and the powers of the aristocracy and the powers of the church. And one way that they tried to do that was to stop criticism and that was to prevent people from um, discussing politics. But people <clears throat> want to talk about politics so they would gather in bars and talk politics secretly but they would also uh, engage in, in singing songs, political songs. Um, and the, the places where they would go to sing these songs were bars that specialised in this, and they were called goguettes. And um, the people who wrote these political songs, and these were best-selling items, were called goguettiers. And Béranger was one of the best-selling goguettiers in France. And um, his books would sell in their thousands. He, he made a comfortable living just writing these songs. And he would the, it, publish the books with the libretto, um, with the uh, mu music, the score, um, and the words. And the trick was that the, um, so here are some pictures of, of, Gauguet, of Gauguet's, this is one by Dormier, uh, and there were even Gauguet's just for women. These were women who would uh, run their own Gauguet's and have <laughs> gatherings together and, and run it themselves and so on. Um, and Béranger was a very interesting character who spent considerable time in Several times he was in, put in prison for his uh, ridiculing of uh, Louis Philippe, um, sorry, for Charles X. And um, one of the songs that was very popular at the time that I'm sure uh, Bastia uh, sang in these goguettes, these, these bars, was a song in praise of smugglers. And this is an illustration from one of the books that Béranger had published with, with his songs in it. Um, so that's a, a page from one of these books. And this is Béranger's Smuggler's Song. And I'll just read you the words. Um, I, I won't sing. You'll be pleased to know I won't sing. Um, curse them, curse them, the revenue men, for we bring happiness and wealth. The people always toast our health. They are indeed our friends. Yes, everywhere the people are our friends. Yes, everywhere, everywhere the people are our friends. Men busy themselves with trade, but taxes bar the way. Let us through, exchanges will be made. There will be balance, this is an economic pun here, there will be balance, come what may, providence protects us everywhere and asks that in return abundance we will share so wealth there is to earn. So you can imagine singing songs, or maybe you can't imagine yourself singing songs like this in a bar. And of course what the police would do is they'd try, if they heard people singing these songs, um, they would break into the bars and try and shut them down. Um, so quite often the, the people who were singing the songs would have two different uh, versions of the verse, right? One innocuous and one praising smuggling, let's say. And then if someone said, oh, the, you know, the bad guy, the police are coming, so they'd switch to the innocuous words. And um, So this sort of goes on. Um, you might think, well, this is all very well, charming, you know, man in his 20s going off to the pub singing songs. Um, what's the practical use of it? Well... This is uh, the, um, the garrison in Bayonne, and in 1830, when Bastiat was 29 or so, 
uh, people that had enough of the reign of Charles X, and he was um, in the process of being overthrown by what would become the July monarchy under Louis Philippe. But the, the, um, the king of France was a Bourbon, the king of Spain was a Bourbon. The, the garrison in Bayonne was in, crucial if the Spanish Bourbon king wanted to send troops to assist his relative, the Bourbon French king, it would have to pass through southern France. And so depending on which way the officers in the uh, uh, garrison went, they could tip the revolution one way or the other. And, um, Bastiat, being a young liberal, uh, mixing in circles in Bayonne, Bayon was very keen that um, Louis Philippe have a chance to get to the throne and, and uh, get rid of the ty tyrannical Charles X. Um, and so what he does is he um, hears that the officers are torn about which way to go, whether they should support the, the king um, to whom they had sworn an oath of allegiance or should they support the, the revolution that's taking place in Paris. Um, and so what Bastia does is he goes off with some friends to talk to the uh, officers in the garrison. Um, and they spend the night, as one does, you know, in France, as you spend the night drinking red wine and singing songs. Um, and this is, and, and Bastia uh, is able to persuade um, the officers of, of the garrison to side with the revolutionaries and not to allow the um, support of the Bourbon, uh, overthrown Bourbon king. And he writes in his correspondence, this is in um, the 5th of August, 1830, and he says, the fifth at midnight. I was expecting blood, but it was only wine that was spilt. The citadel has displayed the tricolor flag. The military containment of the Midi and Toulouse has, been declared, has decided that of Bayonne. The regiments down there have displayed the flag. Thus it is all over. This evening we fraternize with the garrison officers. Punch, wine, liqueurs, and above all, Béranger contributed largely to the festivities. Perfect cordiality reigned in this truly patriotic gathering. The officers were warmer than we were in the same way as horses which have escaped are more joyful than those that are free. So he went there and persuaded um, through his singing and, and uh, of these political songs, he was able to um, participate in the first revolution of his life. He was later to participate in the second revolution in 48. So this is the young Bastia who you know, likes to sing political songs, and um, uh, it doesn't look as though he's got um, anything more intellectually to offer, but something uh, happens to him in the 30s, which is very interesting. This is uh, another aspect of his um, peculiar <coughs> peculiarities as an individual. Um, I don't know what he looked like um, before he went to Paris. The pictures we have of him were him as a, as a deputy, a member of the Chamber of Deputies, uh, like the one we, I saw, showed you at the beginning. But I think this is a, a postcard or a picture from the early um, 19th century um, showing how country gentlemen dressed in Le Londres. Le Londres was the region where he um, lived, and it's very uh, heathy and even marshy in places. And these people on stilts is, is very um, common in that part uh, of the world. Um, and the reason they wore stilts was because of this heath country. They were shepherds, and the heath was very difficult um, to walk through. Um, and they couldn't see the sheep unless they were high, higher. And so they would wear stilts. And they would wear, walk around on, on these stilts. Um, and even today um, in Bayonne and other places, young men, uh, when they have market festivals, Will, um, have, um, will get on these stilts and do jousting contests to try and knock each other off their stilts. So this is seriously weird stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Bastia was a landowner. He had about 250 hectares, which is about 500 acres. Um, and he, he, would have, he had um, sharecroppers working his land. He had other tenants. And so this is what he might have looked like when he went um, uh, to inspect his properties, and uh, he would have had people like that, um, you know, to, to talk to about um, how they were going and how the business was going and so on. Um, now, this is very interesting because um, when he goes to Paris, he refused to wear the traditional clothes of his contemporary economists. Um, they all wore black, 
serious black. Black hats, black coats. And Bastia, I think, would have looked like this, dressed like this country gentleman. And there are some very interesting um, comments uh, by um, some of his friends and colleagues. When, when he died, they wrote obituaries of him and would reminisce about him. And this is um, a reminiscence by Molinari. Um, now, Molinari is an interesting ca case because he was 20 years younger than Bastia, and Molinari lived to be 92. Uh, he was born in 1819 and died in, um, I think, 1912. And he lived long enough to write obituaries for everyone he knew, you know, in the economist movement, including Bastia. And this is um, Molinari's uh, recollection of, of, of Bastia. He said... Um, they had, Bastia was work, uh, Molinari was working as a journalist and um, the, the magazine that he wrote for had reviewed um, some of Bastia's writings very favorably and so Bastia went to, went to visit the office and thanked them personally for writing such a nice review and he ended up writing material for them which became some of the economic sophisms. So this is Molinari's recollection. He says, um, we had a chance to see him when he was making his first rounds of the offices of the journals, which had shown themselves to be sympathetic to the free trade cause. He still hadn't taken time to visit a Parisian tailor or a hatter, if he'd ever thought of doing so. With his long hair and his small hat, his large riding jacket and his oversized umbrella, one would have happily taken him for a solid farmer in the middle of sampling the marvels of the capital city. But the demeanor of this farmer, who was still rough around the edges, was impish and witty. His large dark eyes were keen and bright. His brow was of medium size and somewhat square in shape as if full of ideas and bore the stamp of his thinking. At first glance, one got the impression that this farmer standing before us came from the country of Montaigne, Gascony. And when, one's, when one heard him speak, one immediately recognized in him a disciple of Benjamin Franklin. Right? They, they, Molinari and the other economists greatly admired Benjamin Franklin as a popularizer of economic ideas, and that's how Molinari interpreted um, Bastia. So Bastia refuses to conform to um, the dress codes of, of um, the economists in Paris, and he persisted in wearing clothes much like this. He eventually, uh, possibly as a reward for uh, Supporting uh, Louis Philippe in the Revolution of 1830, he was made a magistrate in Le Grand, which he had for, for between 1831 and 1845. And this is the a postcard of the town square in Le Grand, this very tiny place, uh, only a few hundred people. The, the sort of canton, the larger area around Le Grand, was only a, maybe 10,000 people at the most. Um, in the, um, Let me just go back and say something more about Mugron. When he was in Mugron, he was incredibly intellectually curious. And um, prop, from, as a result of his going to school in this experimental private school, and he and some neighbors set up a book club, which they called rather pretentiously the Academy, after Plato. And um, in the, in the academy, they would meet every week or so and discuss um, books that they had read, newspaper articles and so on. And Bastia was um, very important in that circle, um, singing his songs, playing his musical instrument, but also challenging them constantly with uh, his new ideas. Um, so he spends 20 years or more in, in Mugrant reading all this stuff. And then um, his, some, of his, in some of his correspondence with some of his neighbours and friends, they... He talks with great fondness about this time when he was free to think and, uh, and say anything he liked. Uh, it's a very important part of his life. But something happened to him, I think, around about 1843. He becomes a bit restless. And I'm not quite sure what caused this restlessness. Uh, perhaps he came across the writings of Richard Cobden and the Anti-Corn Law League, which was uh, underway um, in, um, in England. And he'd read about this in the newspapers and he was really impressed with um, the strategies and the um, uh, policies of the anti Cornwall League. And he eventually, of course, becomes one of the most important people in the French free trade movement, which he leads in 1846 when he was living in Paris. So about 1843, he comes across the writings of Richard Cobden. This may have unsettled him, thinking, maybe I have something more to contribute, maybe I can lead 
or create and then lead a French free trade movement like um, Cobden has done in England. Another possibility is that he, at this time, becomes aware that he has this serious throat condition. And I think it is, uh, he, he described about uh, having a polyp in his throat, um, a lump, um, which I suspect was, was cancer. Um, and they didn't know much about cancer in, in the 1840s, but uh, I think he had a sense that he didn't have a great deal of time left to live. And anyway, the um, average <clears throat> lifespan of a working class person, male, in France at this time was about 46 or 47. And then for someone rich, richer like him, who was comfortable, it might have been 50. So if he's sort of in his 43, 44, he may have realised that he didn't have long to live anyway, and that with his throat condition, he may, not have, may only have a few years left. Um, so he may have decided that I need to do something, I need to move out of the, 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 the quietness and security of Mugron and go to Babylon. That's the name he, he gave Paris, Babylon, which, if you've ever been to Paris, is not far from the truth. Um, another possibility is that he, with all his reading of economics, sort of private reading, he might have had thoughts, original thoughts in his mind that suggested to him that he had something to say and, and that you know, Mugron was too much of a confining space um, and that he had to, at, could, it would have taken considerable courage to break from his roots in Mugron and move to a foreign city, uh, a big city, and to make a new life for himself. So it's possibly his interest in Richard Cobden's anti corner League, perhaps, um, this fear that he doesn't have much time to live, and then the th a third option is that maybe he thinks he does have some theory in his head that needs to be written down. Um, we don't know, of course, but that's, that's my speculation. So he goes to Babylon. What does Babylon look like? Well, this, this is an interesting map from <coughs> 1841, and this is what... Um, Bastia would have seen, he would have perhaps, they were just starting to build trains, railways. Um, he would have come up from the southwest. And you'll notice that there are three rings that surround Paris between 1841 and 44. This outer ring of forts was built, and this outer ring of a military wall was built because um, the Prime Minister, Adolphe Thiers, was convinced that the English were going to invade again and that something had to be done for the defences of Paris. The inner wall is a wall that was built in the 1780s um, to help with tax collection. This was the Octroi wall. It was, uh, Octroi was a, a city tax. Anyone entering the city had to go through a, a barrier or a gate to be inspected and then have to pay taxes on whatever they were bringing into the city. There were all sorts of consumer items they had to pay taxes on. That wasn't torn down until... Um, uh, much later, 1859. But these uh, other forts, this was a huge public works uh, construction. Um, they had to reclaim uh, from private owners a huge amount of land to build um, not just the wall, but a, a road that went inside the wall and then um, a couple of hundred yards of clear space so they could have a clear line of fire uh, to shoot the English as they approached um, Paris. Um, and then they built this ring of forts, and um, each of these forts had a certain range for artillery, so they could cover the entire area. Um, so um, this was uh, what Paris looked like when um, Bastia came there. And of course, what it is, is a wonderful symbol of how the state surrounds us with barriers and walls, tax walls, military walls. Um, and these were the things that really irritated and upset Bastiat. And he wanted to smash all those walls and barricades by having free trade and by cutting military expenditure to the bone. Um, Freddie and the Free Traders. <laughs> this I'll I'll end on this because I'm running out of time. And uh, but. Um, If, I, if Bastiat were to um, start a band <laughs> uh, today, um, 
I immediately thought of Freddie Mercury, right? And then I thought, Freddie, Freddie and the Free Traders, what, what a great name for a rock band. <laughs> um, he, he made his name um, with the French Free Trade Association, which um, he was able to set up and work full time for um, in 1846. He became the editor and main writer of their magazine, uh, Le Libre Echange, or Free Trade. And it's in the, that magazine um, that he wrote a lot of the economic sophisms and they were re republished in, in collected form as the economic sophisms. But what he did as a, um, a journalist and activist for free trade was to invent a whole new, what I call a rhetoric of liberty. How he wanted to phrase language that would be persuasive to ordinary people who didn't know much about economics, why they should support free trade and be opposed to government subsidies. Um, and he did this in a very original way, which makes him such a great economic journalist. Um, one of the main weapons that he used um, was the sting of ridicule. That's his expression. I want to make fun, I want to mock everything the government does in order to show it up for what it really is. I want to end all this use of euphemisms to describe what governments do. He said, we have to call a spade a spade or call a cat a cat. And he developed a whole vocabulary, which is brilliantly illustrated in the economic sophisms, um, where he would call the things that the government did um, in this harsh, very critical way. So he, he wanted to call every, the, what the government did theft or plunder, and he came up with a vocabulary to describe this. And so some of the key words that he used over and over again in his writings were words like dépouiller, to dispossess, Spolier, to plunder. Um, Volé, to steal. Um, Pille, to loot or pillage. Filute, to filch. And so he had all these um, abusive words that he was not afraid to use in order to describe what governments did. And then in addition to having these words, he also invented a whole new way of formulating or presenting his ideas in the form of Little plays and dialogues. He became an expert at doing this in the economic sophisms. He'd have a, a stock representative of a free trade position and a stock representative of a protectionist, and he'd have them engage in this um, conversation. And uh, Bastiat would lead the advocate of protectionism to a reductio ad absurdum position and then make fun of them. And he did this over and over again, and that's what makes some of his uh, sophisms so brilliant. He would write fake petitions to the government. And that's exactly what the petition of the candle makers is. But he did several of those. Um, he would do parodies of things like Moliere. And I wanted to give you an example of this. Um, now, just bear with me for a moment, because he's doing a parody of a parody. <laughs> and again, you have to explain this in multiple footnotes in the book. Uh, <laughs> Moliere hated doctors, right? He was suffering from a very bad disease that would eventually kill him. He actually died on stage, which is always an embarrassment for an actor. Um, anyway, so in, in the play, The Hypochondriacs, he writes, Moliere writes a, an, an appendix in Latin. Um, and then as part of that appendix, he has this satirical oath of induction for do people who want to become doctors. And so these, and it, this is all in Latin. And, and so the, the Latin... So this doc would-be doctor who wants to be sworn into the fraternities of the medical profession has to swear in public, um, ego cum isto boneto venerabili et doctor, don tibi et concedo vetutum et puissiantam, medicandi, purgandi, signandi, persandi, diandi, cupandi, et occidenti impune per total, total terram. I hope you got all that. Um, what that means in, in English um, is I give and grant to you the power and authority to practice medicine, to purge, to bleed, to stab, to hack, to slash and kill with impunity throughout the whole world. <laughs> so what does Bastiat do in one of, this, one of his great... Um, he, he does his own version of this. This is a etching, um, a, a drawing by Dormier showing um, Louis-Philippe um, as a plunderer, gargantua. Now, Louis Philippe uh, was the king, and he had this unfortunate physical shape that he looked like a pear, and so all the cartoonists drew him as a pear, and so he, he would put them in prison, 
and their cartoons would sell more, and more cartoonists would draw him as a pair. So it was... Anyway, so this is um, Bastiat's parody of Molière, Molière's parody, where he says, this is the oath of induction for a would-be customs inspector. Right? I'll skip some of the, the introduction introductory stuff, he says, volandi, piandi, derobandi, felutandi, and escroquandi, impune per totam istam via, which in English is, I give to you and grant virtue and power to steal, to plunder, to filch, to swindle, to defraud at will along this whole road. <laughs> right, so, this is very funny, but, um, and that is, that is Bastia's style, and that is what makes him so endearing, I think, um, to, to, to readers. Um, so I've just, I'll, I'll close now and open up for questions, but what I wanted to show you was that behind the economic journalist there is another Bastiat, or, or several Bastiats. He is a radical um, in his style of writing and doing things like these satires and plays on words. He's also personally radical and he's different with his clothing and his behaviour bursting into song, he's constantly quoting Moliere. Um, he was notorious for not just singing political songs, but bawdy songs, which he would have sung in the bars of Bayonne. Um, Molinari described him as having a Rabelaisian wit, uh, which is a euphemism for saying that he made sexual references constantly in his uh, singing. But he's also, I think, and I haven't gone into this in any, any detail because I don't have time, but I think... We can, there is a strong case to be made that he was, um, well, I call him a proto-Austrian, I don't think he was fully there, but he was very, very close, um, and that he has, he had in it, to, to, in himself, he had the, the knowledge and the ideas to write a really great book of economic theory, but uh, his throat cancer killed him before he could finish. So I'll leave it there and open it up for, for questions. We need to get our microphones, don't we? Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for the very entertaining talk. Uh, early on, you mentioned that uh, you believe Bastiat had some insights on public choice. I yeah. happen to be taking a public choice class and need a paper to write, so uh. if, <laughs> if, you, if you wouldn't care to expand on that, that'd be great. Thank you. See me, I've got some cheat notes. Oh, excellent, this is great. Um, I, I didn't plant this guy here to ask that question. Oh, I totally didn't. Um, I'll give you just a quick summary. Um, in, in terms of just general economic analysis, um, he, he obviously understood the idea of opportunity cost. That's the whole point of the seen and the unseen. Um, he had a, a very early understanding of ceteris paribus. He was one of the earliest users of that expression. I think John Stuart Mill was, has been accredited with being the first, and he started writing about it in 1843. Bastiat's using it in 1845. I don't think he's read um, John Stuart Mill. Um, so where he gets it, I, I just don't know. Um, uh, there's a whole list here of Austrian stuff, but in pu purely public choice, uh, he'd say, he would, uh, they would be things like, he understands that bureaucrats and politicians have self-interest that they pursue, um, and they're trying to maximise power, income, or whatever. Um, the state is really a, a, a broker for um, allocating benefits for vested interest groups. Um, he thinks he has a whole theory about state power um, and that um, there are limits to state power because the more you steal from people, the more they try to either hide their um, wealth or they try to um, resist in some way. And so he has a whole theory of, of how the state functions and how bureaucrats try to expand their power and how there are limits to that. They're sort of built in. Um, he has, a, he has he, in, the, in the house, in the chamber, he gave a talk about the dangers of parties being set up and how parties would be rivals for um, controlling the, the chamber. Um, and how, so, so, so they're just a few off the top of my head that I can, I, I can tell you. Uh, but come and see me afterwards and we can, we can do that. Uh, he lived uh, at a time where there was uh, a lot of turmoil in Europe. Uh, what were his views of the commune? The commune, that's, too, he's too early for that. Um, I presume you're talking about the Commune of 1870, 71? Yeah, no, no, earlier. 
Yeah. Earlier? Yeah. Um, you, you know, all the, the riots in the streets and all that stuff. Well, the French are always rioting in the streets. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the Commune is, it come, is, a, is another revolution. Uh, this is the 1848 revolution where... Um, here we are. I, I was going to talk about this. These, he was involved in um, events in 1848 where... <clears throat> This was a government inquiry set up after the uh, events of June of 1848. And this is a map showing all the barricades that were set up in the streets of Paris to prevent the troops from coming down and, and putting people, um, you know, controlling the streets. Um, and they looked like that. The, the French had developed a whole science of building barricades. and. Um, <laughs> They would use carts and, and, and uh, iron railings and paving stones and so on. They had a whole uh, culture about how... They would have a barricade monitors for each block, you know, who would run the barricade. And Bastiat gets caught in the streets. Um, and, and he um, was torn about this because, uh, on the one hand, he thought what they were riot rioting for was often positive in the sense they wanted lower taxes, especially on food and salt and alcohol. Because, as you know, in, in France, alcohol is a staple of anyone's diet. Um, and so, um, but he didn't agree with the socialists who joined forces with some of the barricade um, operators who wanted to maintain or increase government subsidies and, and payments to the unemployed. And um, he, that was why he was on the streets and why he was caught in this, because he was ha out there handing um, newspapers and pamphlets um, to people trying to persuade them not to uh, be seduced by socialist uh, claims that they could make their lives better by taxing them more. On the streets of Paris, he and his mate, uh, Gustave de Molinari, are handing out this newspaper on the streets of Paris, and they also had a version which they could plaster up on the walls. And they would um, pay people to... And this book is a whole book of things that got plastered up on the walls of Paris in June of 1848. Uh, but he was torn. Um, some he supported, some he didn't. Um, yeah. So I too have heard the, uh, the Leonard Reed story and uh, the person who came up to him was reported to me to be Thomas Nixon Carver, who is a Harvard economist and then retired and went out to California to live. Um, but my, my question to you then is, okay. um, what was the relationship between Bastia and uh, Cobden and, and Bright? Uh, I know that they, they corresponded, yes. but now, didn't, did they come to visit him in, in France, or what, what was their, their relationship? Um, when Bastia first read the propaganda and newspapers of the anti colonial League, he wrote to Cobden and uh, told him of his plans to do something in France, and uh, from that time on they became very close friends, at least in terms of correspondence. Bastiat went to England twice, I think, both times to talk with, with Cobden. Cobden came to Europe on a celebration tour after when the repeal of the Corn Laws was finally passed, he went on a victory, to, victory lap of <laughs> Europe and he was welcomed very much um, in Paris where they had a banquet and dinner and Bastiat was one of the people who gave a, a toast to Cobden probably sang him a few political songs as well, just thrown in for free. Um, there, I came across some very interesting um, insinuations in the correspondence that Bastia in um, October or November 1849 was sent on a secret mission by the French government to try and, to go and talk to Cobden secretly about a, a disarmament um, possibilities. Um, so that was... You know, he was a member of the Chamber of Deputies and Cobden was a, a figure in the, in the Parliament. And, but, of course, nothing happened. Uh, but possibilities of some conspiracy, free trade conspiracy in London. Okay, thank you.